very good afternoon friends once again on behalf of uh, cms vatavaran i welcome you all i am sabya sachi bharti uh, as you know that every day from 4 to 5 during this 11th competitive section of cms vatavaran environmental film festival and forum that is happening first time on hybrid mode where you can watch all these 89 nominated films on the various aspects of environment climate change and wildlife conservation on india science ott channel which is powered by department of science and technology government of india and vigyan prasar which is a, a autonomous body of the dst G, government of india so every day we talk to uh, you know one uh, filmmaker we discuss about uh, his journey or her journey about uh, his film so uh, today also i'm i'm uh, it's my privilege that i'm going to talk to one of the most you know promising young environment and science filmmaker of our country rakesh rao uh, before i invite rakesh rao uh, to the uh, to talk and about his journey and the film let me introduce you to rakesh rakesh is a photographer filmmaker and a science enthusiast and specializes in documenting scientific expeditions and research activities his recent film the climate change won the best science film award in at the international science film festival of india and which is also nominated in the 11th cms vatavaran film festival and forum and you can watch his film this the climate change uh, the, the climate challenge uh, on the ott channel of india science till 23rd of april uh rakesh has spent 14 14 months over the span of 3 years in the icy continent of antarctica to document the construction of the third indian scientific section bharati at lastman hill antarctica he ha- he also developed a documentary film following the indian scientists researching on the high altitude glaciers of the himalayan region he was also part of the nasa space world bound india expedition to the high altitude region in ladakh jam uh uh and uh his work has been published in a book 90 degrees south and several of his photographs has been part of international photo exhibitions and friends he i think uh, if uh, correct me if i am wrong he is the only filmmaker from india who has visited uh, himalayas arctic and antarctica so it's my pleasure to welcome uh, my friend and a very promising filmmaker young filmmaker rakesh rao uh Welcome, Rakesh. Uh, you are mute. Yeah. Yes. Hi, 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 Sabhusachi. Thanks a lot for the wonderful in- introduction. Yeah. So, uh, Rakesh, before we uh, you know start discussing about uh, the the film Climate Challenge, let me uh, please let us know that how you started the journey. What is your background? Are you from a filmmaking background? Uh, and how you so what is the uh, journey? How it started? The, the, well, the I come from a science background. I did my uh, physics uh, uh, mm-hmm. masters, and um, during the time, probably I, I mean, I was already into you know uh, photography, and I mm-hmm. was interested since young. I was into photography and uh, a bit into filmmaking, not mm-hmm. totally, but because mm-hmm. that time we never had those equipments, you know, the and the editing softwares and mm-hmm. uh, even the laptops. But photography mm-hmm. was my main forte. and mm-hmm. um, yeah post my masters uh, probably uh, nobody gave me a job <laughs> and that was one of the reason i thought you know of combining uh, photography and filmmaking with something that i'm passionate about that is promoting mm-hmm. science actually mm-hmm. uh, on a bit serious note uh, probably um, uh, my journey started more out, out of a frustration frustration mm-hmm. i say this because uh, i was too much into astronomy and uh, mm-hmm. during the time post my masters uh, i was more inclined towards you know getting a P- applying for phd programs and things of that sort and mm-hmm. i knew everything that was happening in in nasa and isa and things of that sort but what was happening in india mm-hmm. i had absolutely no idea because many of the research institution their websites were not uh, uh, you know up, up to date uh, we mm-hmm. could not get any information that was happening and mm-hmm. science outreach was never uh, you know a main uh, concern Mm-hmm. for scientific uh, research mm-hmm. uh, scientists used to be one side they used to do their research and publish it and mm-hmm. common public never bothered mm-hmm. kind of a thing so mm-hmm. that's when i felt you know it's very important that i start uh, you know a kind of um, mixing the two that mm-hmm. is science popularization uh, and uh, since my forte is with you know science and physics and uh, things of that sort 
and uh, something that I loved and I'm passionate about that is photography and filmmaking. So that's when I started my journey as uh, a photographer come filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and it, it just propelled from there, you know, after one after another project. And, uh, and I was so, into environment also. So yes, I yes. It's a good way. I, I always felt that uh, photography and films are a wonderful medium to communicate science. And, and, and it, it propelled from there. So, what was your first professional work assignment? What I wanted to. Oh, it started off. Um, I, it started off from my college days. In fact, uh, uh, just post my masters, uh, uh, and when I was in the college, I had a professor, uh, Professor Orlando, uh, mm -hmm. from the geo department. Although I was from the physics department, but mm -hmm. uh, I was too much inclined towards you know. I used to be majority of the time in probably all the other departments than my own mm -hmm. department. Mm. Uh, because I was more curious to know more about, you know, earth sciences or botany, zoology, apart from mm. the physics that I learned. So there mm. was this one project that he had of, uh, you know, uh, documenting the coastline of Goa. Mm. And it was a DST funded project. Mm. And unfortunately, untimely, he expired. Uh, mm. But um, uh, that project had to be done. And uh, probably mm. that was the time when I had just started uh, my work as a, a documentary person of documenting mm -hmm. and uh, the college asked me, would you be interested in doing it? Mm -hmm. And that's when um, there was a small amount of uh, you know money involved and uh, I bought a camera uh, and uh, I took up a loan and bought a camera and I did mm -hmm. the project. And when I was doing the project, probably I started enjoying it a lot. I mean, I mm -hmm. felt that probably uh, this is something that I should concentrate more. And it started off with that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the other projects um, went on post that project mm -hmm. and slowly started applying for other projects. Yeah. So, uh, Rakesh, probably you are the, you know, the single uh, one of the, the, the only filmmaker in India, correct me if uh, I'm wrong, that, uh, which has the opportunity to visit Arctic, Antarctica and also Himalayas. So how this happened, because this is a very big achievement. And uh, and what I know is that you are also working for uh, ISRO these days. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I'm not uh, so sure, but uh, maybe it's true or not. I don't know whether I'm the only filmmaker who has visited all the three polar regions. We consider mm -hmm. Himalaya also as uh, one of the cryospheric poles. That's why I say mm -hmm. all the three polar regions. Uh, mm -hmm. But I haven't come across people. I've come across people who have gone to Arctic. I've come across mm -hmm. people who have gone to Antarctic. And mm -hmm. few of them who have done films in Himalaya. But visiting all the three, I'm not sure whether uh, mm -hmm. people have done that. But um, I mean, I, I feel always privileged that I had this opportunity to actually, mm -hmm. you know, go and see all these three places and document mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and ISRO, we just did one project. I mean, we are not doing any more projects currently with them, but it was one very interesting project that we got to do of uh, developing mm -hmm. the official teaser of mm -hmm. the Chandrayaan 2 mission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, now uh, coming to the film, uh, the climate challenge. So uh, how this film came, like uh, you thought of this film or it just came to you, uh, like how the beginning, how it started? So. Many of my documentation projects that I did for uh, in the Antarctic, Arctic, and the Himalaya were mm -hmm. mainly to you know follow scientists and understand mm -hmm. the research work what they're doing and come up mm -hmm. with these uh, you know regular films mm -hmm. for the institution that is National Center for Polar and Ocean Research. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, while I was to do that, I used to always you know have this um, notion that uh, probably it's 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 important that uh, we talk about uh, not only one region as an mm -hmm. individual uh, film, but mm -hmm. uh, it's important we start talking about all the three polar regions and mm -hmm. their interconnection. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, all three of them are interconnected. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, just two days back, there was a research uh, uh, publication that has come out of mm -hmm. how Antarctica controls our Indian monsoon. Mm -hmm. And now we also know that Indian monsoon plays a very important part uh, with the Arctic melting. 
okay. because the heat gets deposited uh, in the Arctic and uh, mm -hmm. the Arctic L connection, which is there. Mm -hmm. So all these three polar regions are are kind of connected. It's not that mm -hmm. they are in the one is in the Arctic, which is far away mm -hmm. from India, and other one is in Antarctic, which is e equally far. And mm -hmm. why should we care about it? And all mm -hmm. these. That's why I felt that it's important that we talk about this three interconnection. And at mm -hmm. the same time, while I was there on field. Uh, you know, we have the stereotypical notion, if, if, for instance, and I always mm -hmm. do this whenever we have any workshops or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, interaction, I ask kids, when I say the word scientist, mm -hmm. what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Mm -hmm. Everybody has a stereotypical notion that, you know, scientists are people who will wear lab coats, mix two chemicals, or sit in front of the computer, have weird hair and wear spectacles or whatever. This is the kind of notion that we have created in, through these, you know, Bollywood, Hollywood, sci-fi films. Mm -hmm. But then that is partly true, but uh, not entirely true. We have our own Indian scientists who are braving the odds, you know, uh, surviving some of the most extreme climate and extreme and some of the harshest environments, whether it's in the mm -hmm. Ar uh, Arctic, Antarctic, minus mm -hmm. 30s, heavy blizzards, mm -hmm. uh, surviving, you know, at uh, 20,000 feet, uh, mm -hmm. understanding, decoding the glaciers. Mm -hmm. and uh, um, jumping through the crevasses just to get all i mean they do all this just to get the climate data mm -hmm. so i felt the story needs to be told and this uh, that's why the film is not called as climate change i mean there are thousands of films on climate change that's why it's called the climate challenge challenge it, it, yes. talks, it talks about the the challenge that happens uh, behind uh, getting this climate data mm -hmm. and how the data gets interpreted and uh, things mm -hmm. of that sort so, so uh, that, that's yeah. So, how the film started? Like, what was the preparation you had done? And uh... uh well, see, as I said, I mean, all these three uh, projects were actually individual projects. I mean, okay. they had when when we started off filming it, they were uh, individual projects. But then I had this, you know, huge tons of data with me of all the mm -hmm. three places. And then mm -hmm. when I when you see when you get into this field, you start. Uh, reading a lot of research papers and you start understanding, you start interacting with the scientists and you start seeing it. So I had a huge data mine of uh, content with me. Mm -hmm. And then I felt that, okay, I mean, I think I need to present this content into a bit more uh, um, exciting form and also mm -hmm. show the story of the scientists of mm -hmm. going, reaching to the extreme places and things mm -hmm. like that. Sort. So that's when I felt, and I started working on a script mm -hmm. and, uh, and then started piecing the puzzle together and that's the film okay that you see. so we will talk about you know the film and the interconnectedness of all these three uh, uh, uh pools uh, so before doing that let me play a clip from the film first The majestic land of tall mountains and glaciers is currently one of the world's most sensitive hotspot to global climate change. A new report suggests that at least a third of the Himalayan glaciers are expected to melt by the end of this century. A situation that is predicted to intensify in the coming years with dire and far-reaching consequences on availability of water, food, and energy. All the major North Indian rivers owe their origin to thousands of glaciers in the Himalayan region. Nearly 1.5 billion population depend directly on these rivers. According to the latest glacier inventory, there are about 9,575 glaciers in the Indian Himalayan region. With changing climate, there are empirical evidences of how the melting of these glaciers are affecting both regional as well as global climate. A team of scientists are now braving the odds to carry out research in these extreme conditions and jagged terrain to understand the impact of changing climate on these glaciers. This team is currently monitoring six benchmark glaciers in the Lahal and Spiti region. Today, they are planning to investigate the Suthri Dhaka Glacier.
we are heading to Sutridhaka glacier it is around 25 square kilometers in area and 11 kilometers in length and it is our benchmark glaciers we are studying that glaciers very thoroughly so we are starting our scientific activities uh, first from Sutridhaka glacier so we are taking scientific equipments like flow tracker and then differential GPS coder and other equipments and we'll be starting our uh, scientific activities from tomorrow so we'll be pitching advanced camp today and from tomorrow we'll start our activity wow so uh, this uh, this glacier how uh, what what was the height of what is the height of this glacier so like uh, if if you if you heard in the documentary uh, yeah. like the entire uh, hindukush himalaya region mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. close to i mean uh, the glacial inventory suggests there were around 54000 glaciers mm -hmm. and in india it's somewhere close to 9000 odd glaciers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, this particular institute that i i primarily did the work for mm -hmm. uh, they monitor six glaciers in the chandra basin okay and um, most of their are so the glacier starts from the snout area mm -hmm. and then it, it moves all the way to 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 the height of the mountain uh, that's mm -hmm. called the accumulation zone okay. so anywhere uh, uh, the work used to happen anywhere between you know six thousand sixteen thousand uh, feet to mm -hmm. all the way to 18 to nineteen thousand feet uh above mean sea level so sixteen thousand so, to eighteen thousand rakis how you were you know uh, uh, managing like uh, because oxy oxygen is very less uh, in that yeah. height and then the equipments look how you were managing have you you know inventing new techniques or or you know uh, uh, what about the gears what about the you know heavy uh, camera and so what was the you know yeah. your so, what does up so anything anything about 16000 feet it's like you're about uh, the uh, half of the earth's atmosphere so mm -hmm. the oxygen is almost at almost 60 percent of what it is on the mean sea level so mm -hmm. uh, whenever we reach to any of these places uh, we do a lot of acclimatization first i mean two days we just don't do anything we try to you know uh, acclimatize our body because for a person from goa who stays literally on the coast to yeah. go all the way to sixteen thousand feet is, is is like crazy i mean and if you don't acclimatize properly then you can mm -hmm. get a lot of uh, health issues Mm -hmm. whether it's acute mountain sickness or you have the um, pulmonary edemas or cerebral edema that can that can happen high altitude so you have to acclimatize and then we did a lot of acclimatization runs i mean we used to go you know pack our bags and go in the morning you know trek halfway and then come back stay for another day so that you know our body gets adjusted to the high altitude mm -hmm. uh, region Mm -hmm. And um, uh, if, if uh, frankly, if I have to quantify, when uh, uh, like the Arctic is uh, like it, it's much more like easy peasy kind of a thing. Well, okay. Antarctica, uh, 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 see, in the Arctic, it's basically the cold that 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 kind of. Rakes, Rakes, we will come to Arctic and Antarctica later. On. First, you know, no. because no, the, the, all these that? three three things are yeah. like very different, quite different from each no, other. I, I just wanted to kind of quantify the uh, the problems that occur mm. because Arctic is much easier expedition. Yeah. It's just the okay. cold which might kill you. Whereas okay. the Antarctic, it is mm -hmm. the cold and the isolation that might kill you, right? Okay. Because you're far away. But Himalaya is like out of the roof. You okay. have the cold, you have the isolation and you have the altitude. Okay. So, that that is like uh, a, a different level of uh, expedition my toughest expedition uh, although i've done like you know three expeditions to the arctic mm -hmm. uh, survived minus 35 in the arctic and uh, even in the uh -huh. uh, sorry the, in the antarctic and the arctic and even the southern ocean but uh -huh. the most toughest expedition that i have done is in the himalayas okay and uh, although beautiful but uh, it's 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 treacherous i think probably the maximum amount of bones that i've broken is also in the himalayas mm -hmm. uh, by falling and all kinds of uh, issues having a, having a slip disc issue and things of that sort it's all because of the himalayan mm -hmm. expedition which mm -hmm. is part and parcel of any any work uh, but uh, yeah i mean uh, working there and so luckily uh, with the scientific crew uh -huh. uh, we had good amount of support staff. Uh, so uh, the Mr. Singh who was talking is a scientist. Yeah, he's a scientist. He, he looks like a very... Bollywood film yeah. hero. Yeah. And we had a very, <laughs> I was very different happy. kind of notion of scientists. Absolutely. In fact, in fact, many if you see the film also, you'll find a lot of people 
who are like you know uh, i mean they they're really cool i mean in mm-hmm. fact ajit for that matter ajit singh uh, i have some snapshot of his uh, when we were in the high up in the glacier i mean i was too scared to you know cross the the crevasses uh-huh. but he is like you know pretty chill about it because he has oh, done just several a second. what is this crevasse you have to explain so, it for the general people yeah so crevasse is basically uh, i mean when you have the ice that is constantly moving right because of the gravity okay and this ice is not a uniform kind of a thing there are a lot mm-hmm. of uh, cuts that happen and sometimes uh-huh. these cracks they open up okay. and when they open up it's like uh, almost like a, a 20 to 30 meters uh, or 40 meters sometimes uh, uh, there's depth uh, i mean mm-hmm. you can fall if you fall into a crevasse it's mm-hmm. pretty risky and wow. uh, sometimes the 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 crevasse zones are pretty big the the cracks mm-hmm. are pretty big so you have to put mm-hmm. up a ladder and cross across mm-hmm. but uh, at, at that you will find mostly in the mount everest side kind of a thing mm-hmm. but uh, here we had crevasses which were pretty deep but okay. not too far so you can jump over them Mm-hmm. so i i had my i had a cold feet in the cold region to actually jump across it but there is this guy you know his his one leg is across the crevasse and other on on the other side his butt is on the other side of the crevasse and he was like you know he's just chilling about it so it these are the instances which i actually felt that we need to tell these stories the, mm-hmm. these are the people probably we have that notion that science is all that happens only in the labs it is not the case science can be adventurous science can be you know beautiful when you when you when you get to uh, witness these places and experience some of the things which nobody gets to experience mm. it's very it's a very rare genre of doing field science and field uh, kind of thing so yeah i mean that was about it uh and uh, so now uh... what about the antarctica like how it happens and uh, because people are saying that it's very difficult to go there and you have to go to a set of trainings for a certain such a long period and then you go so uh, like how you got the opportunity to go to uh, you know antarctica and what was the training process again the same question what about the gears you know the fill, the ec- okay. equipments because it's too cold there so uh so india has been you know participating in uh, antarctic expedition for almost now 42 years i mean this mm-hmm. year the 42nd expedition will be going to antarctica mm-hmm. right from 1981 when mm-hmm. our first expedition was launched mm-hmm. uh, we built up a station called dakshin gangotri which survived mm-hmm. for 3 years then we have a station called maitri and mm-hmm. uh, in 2010 we started the construction of the third indian research station called bharti mm-hmm. so uh, I, Uh, so every year the institute you know calls for proposals for scientific mm-hmm. research uh, mm-hmm. and uh, for for traveling to antarctica for doing conducting any science work and things of that sort mm-hmm. so i put up a proposal and the proposal actually you know goes through a lot of scrutiny and then you have to defend your proposal in front of the national committee mm-hmm. and once the committee selects uh, that still doesn't assure that you can go to antarctica they okay. will actually uh, send you to 5 days of intense medical checkup at uh, all india institute of medical sciences mm-hmm. so literally everything is checked uh, so that you know there is no issues once you are in antarctica kind of a thing because mm-hmm. if you are going to say if you are going to arctic or himalaya rescue mm-hmm. missions can happen and arctic is so easy that you know you can take the next flight and you can come back oh. but antarctica you go you, you go on a particular day and you come back mm-hmm. on a particular day in okay. between say you feel homesick or you 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 fall sick or something like that uh, nothing can happen you have to wait and okay. if you die then you in summers yes you will be rescued back or your body can come back but in winters then uh, it, luckily nothing so much has happened to us of course we have lost few people but uh, we can get the body back kind of and thing. still you are saying that himalaya is dif- you difficult then uh, antarctica it is challenging yeah, yeah himalaya is extremely challenging i mean uh, uh, antarctica is beautiful but uh, we have uh, you know a lot of uh, uh, because 42 expeditions have happened and we have mm-hmm. a beautiful station out there mm-hmm. and things of that sort but uh, okay. just to coming to the uh, the selection process or whatever so even if yes. you clear the medicals and uh, they give you a go it still doesn't mm-hmm. mean you can go to antarctica because you have to then go uh, for a compulsory 15 days uh, uh, altitude high altitude training uh, at mm-hmm. oli uh, that's okay. done by the indo tibetan border police force mm-hmm. so they literally train you in you know basic rock climbing and if you fall into a crevasse how do you rescue yourself first aid 
there is a mm-hmm. lot of theory sessions that happen and a lot of ice craft and snow craft that, that's been thought to us mm-hmm. and only when they feel that okay this this person can survive and take over i mm-hmm. mean take care of himself in antarctica mm-hmm. then you fly down to cape town and then from cape town you either fly into antarctic uh, towards the maitri station or else mm-hmm. you take a ship and then you reach antarctic uh, so so, uh, so uh, generally uh, indians go from cape town because somewhere i had in a documentary, I have seen that people go to Chile and then uh, go to the last part of the Chile and then they take a, 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 you know, a special yeah. uh, Antarctica vessel or b- huh. big boat and then they cross that uh, sea and then they go to Antarctica. So people people have this misnotion you know, that Antarctica is you know at the bottom and it is very small kind of a thing. But it is not the case. In fact, two of India entire surface area of uh, our country can be mm-hmm. fitted into Antarctica with some uh, re, uh, some area left for all the island nations to actually fit in. It's, wow. it's the fifth largest. It's so continent. huge. It's very huge. In fact, and Antarctica, the shape is somewhat like this uh, kind mm-hmm. of a thing. So mm-hmm. from the Chile side, you reach to the peninsular region of okay. Antarctic. So uh-huh. it, we have two stations in Antarctica. One is called Maitri and another one is called Bharti. So mm-hmm. if I have to tell you the location, you can just go to Cape of Good Hope in, mm-hmm. in Cape Town, I mean, in South Africa. Yes, and then yes, you start yes. swimming straight away down, then you'll reach Maitri. And mm-hmm. if you go to Kanyakumari, uh, yes, you, region, then, then also you can, down, then you'll reach yes. Bharti station. And the distance between the two stations is 3000 kilometers. So that's wow. like Kanyakumari to Ladakh and back. So that's yes. the kind of uh, size and shape uh, Antarctica holds. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and so, before the expedition actually is to go from Goa, uh, but okay. it is to take almost you know a month to reach Antarctic because you have to go through a longer uh, ocean sailing and things mm-hmm. of that sort. Uh, but now, in order to reduce the time, we fly to Cape Town, and it becomes much easier for us to you know we reach so what, in seven to eight days. So what have you done? Like how for how many days you were there in Antarctica, and and, and what was your routine, and what have you done? Well, like why you went there? So I was actually involved with the documentation of the third Indian research station, mm-hmm. right from you know concept to conceptualization kind of mm-hmm. thing. So um, uh, I went in the th- 10th expedition when we had this island uh, called Bharti Promontory and mm-hmm. uh, through the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting, that no, the, the Antarctic Treaty that governs Antarctica because it's a no man's land. So yeah. after almost ten years of you know putting uh, asking for the uh, for that particular land to put up a station, it was uh, mm-hmm. given to us. And in 2010, the first uh, a team went to you know start the construction mm-hmm. of the third mm-hmm. Indian Research Station. Mm-hmm. So when we went there, it was just barren, covered in snow, kind of a thing. Now mm-hmm. we have one of the, the the best and probably one of the high tech stations in Antarctica, in mm-hmm. the entire uh, continent. It is so high tech that uh, sitting here, if I have the IP address, I can actually control the lights. Uh, I can check uh, the fuel. I can wow. check everything about mm-hmm. the station health uh, mm-hmm. because there's so much amount of advanced system that has been put into it. Uh, so how many so days? You three. So uh, the work was scheduled to go into austral summers. Mm-hmm. Uh, summers go from you know December somewhere. In, we we used to leave early somewhere in the month of October. Because mm-hmm. we used to get good amount of uh, sunlight even during October, but few amount of uh, dark nights. Mm-hmm. Uh, but by December, it used to be 24 hours of daylight. So mm-hmm. even at 2 o'clock at night, you go out, the sun is there to say hello to you, mm-hmm. and, uh, kind of a thing. So we, the con- station construction was supposed to happen between two seasons, two austral mm-hmm. summers. Because mm-hmm. winter, you can't uh, build a station. Because mm-hmm. it's too, too harsh of an environment. Mm-hmm. Uh, but lucky for me and unlucky for the construction crew that uh, there was a blizzard and then we could not uh, complete the station construction. Mm-hmm. The remaining last 10% remained. And mm-hmm. since my project was to do with the documentation of the construction, my I could not complete my film because of the remaining 10%. Mm-hmm. So I got a chance to go to the third time. It was a, a, a hat-trick uh, session for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of thing. So yeah, I, I spent close to almost fourteen months uh, in Antarctica. And what was the general routine there? And what about the gears, like the cameras and all these things? Yeah, uh, I, I used to hear a lot of people, you know, uh, have issues uh, with uh, camera gears and extreme climate. But mm-hmm. uh, somehow I never faced anything. I mean, probably the gears today have become so advanced and so so robust 
mm-hmm. that even in extreme temperatures and extreme climate mm-hmm. um, of course i did face some issues with you know some focusing issue because of mm-hmm. the the cold the, the lens is to you know become a bit rigid and mm-hmm. the focusing is to effect but mm-hmm. uh, but you can put it on manual and you can do your work kind of a thing and uh, there was never a issue that i faced as such mm-hmm. a okay. bit of battery drain here and there but uh, mm-hmm. and condensation because mm-hmm. when we work outside it has to be in the negative temperature but when mm-hmm. you come to the station inside it has to be around plus 18 degrees mm-hmm. so the the change of temperature is to just condense on the on the lens Mm-hmm. so i had to wait for it to cool down and then get it in so nothing uh, sort of any big kind of problem it was just a small problem no absolutely not in fact uh, the uh, and i used to i never shot with you know bigger cameras or anything mm-hmm. because i prefer to shoot things on a dslr camera mm-hmm. uh, because of multiple reasons one is because of the form factor it is it is mm-hmm. very small you can easily put it up in a bag and take it and you can take multiples of them instead of mm-hmm. one uh, the thing and uh, mm-hmm. like in the even in the himalayas we had issues uh, thanks to mm-hmm. the multiple gear we had a bag which rolled down in you know, almost 300 meters uh, from one of the glacial site and mm-hmm. two of our cameras actually broke uh, oh. so thanks because it was a dslr we had another spare dslr with us we could continue the filming uh, okay. so that's why uh, and they give almost the same i would not say the same but almost the quality that you need i mean it it mm-hmm. does the work for you so and what about the arctic 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 is beautiful i mean uh, if i have to say uh, but mm-hmm. it's very easy i mean it's it's not harsh uh, of mm-hmm. course if you go in winter it is harsh for sure but uh, during summers it is it is a it, it, it's a beautiful beautiful uh, place especially uh, during the summers because you have the snow that melts and then the arctic tundra you know starts blooming out there you have the grass coming out and with the grass you have the reindeers and uh, the arctic fox that that keeps coming in and occasionally you end up seeing few polar bears uh, what about by. flies and mosquitoes uh there are insects now uh that mm-hmm. you can see but mosquitoes especially when i was there we were in much higher arctic it was not in the the lower arctic so we were almost close to 80 degree 80 degrees north that's in a place called falbo so uh, they, uh, the north so pole it is like 1000 so it is to to uh, it's from norway it was near or from canada it was near so from norway it was near okay i mean if 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 i could take the aerial route probably canada was 3000 kilometers away just like bharti okay. to maitri and okay. the north pole was 1200 uh, kilometers from from okay. the place where i was in fact the first uh, flight uh, done by ronald uh, amundsen mm-hmm. uh, during the north uh, north pole journey started mm-hmm. from the place where we went mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i mean okay. uh, way back in the ni- 1950 so have you got the chance to go to the north pole the north pole no 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 not yet uh, hopefully uh, i don't know i'm i'm still applying there was this project that i was supposed to uh, be part of but then uh, covid crisis and all all those things changed uh, which was supposed to head closer to the north pole but not north pole but yeah it's, it would be interesting to actually visit the pole right so so, so rakesh now we are, now we talked about all these three poles where you visited understand we understood like what was the temperature there what was the problem there now tell me because you had seen all these three and your film is on climate change first thing let j- tell us like how these three uh, arctic antarctica and himalaya are connected interconnected are they connected interconnected at all and how you know climate change is affecting all these three uh, places and if something happened in arctic is it going to affect antarctica or himalaya or something happening in antarctica is affecting himalayas and at the, henceforth you know and then at the end anything happening arctic and antarctica is also you know affecting indian uh, season oh. and the, so how it's all interconnected you know and what, uh, the no- <clears throat> the notion that we live on a static planet is actually mm-hmm. wrong we live on a extremely dynamic planet Mm-hmm. and uh, the dynamism of this planet is that we all are connected through ocean mm-hmm. right uh, the ocean is something that 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 connects all all the land masses mm-hmm. and technically our our uh, 
planet is basically a seven, we although we call it a terra planet but actually mm-hmm. it's more of an ocean planet we are 70% ocean mm-hmm. and uh, that's that's the sad part about it that we give all the credit to the te- terrestrial side of it but uh, ocean is is rich and ocean mm-hmm. is something that connects all the three cryospheric polar region whether mm-hmm. uh, it connects the antarctic to the arctic arctic mm-hmm. to the antarctic and via mm-hmm. the entire passing passage over it connects the tropics mm-hmm. where we have the himalayas so okay. what happens in one of the polar region will is surely connected and it it has started affecting the other region and mm-hmm. uh, there is so much of interconnection that happens and the mm-hmm. other form that that keeps us connected is the air Mm-hmm. the air over all these uh, regions are constantly mm-hmm. circulating you know the air air is not uh, static i mean the air mm-hmm. over india doesn't remain just over india it mm-hmm. it flows into pakistan it flows into the arctic side of it and arctic air comes here and things like that mm-hmm. so all of this is kind of connected now mm-hmm. what is happening with climate change is that there are multiple issues that are happening and uh, of mm-hmm. late and it it's in fact very alarming i mean uh we all uh, talk about covid as as uh, i mean covid came and you know it, it became like a doomsday scenario kind of thing we didn't know whether we would survive or not or something like that but covid is actually it's not even like 5% of the killer that would happen the biggest mm-hmm. killer that's going to happen in in years to come is uh climate change and okay. uh things are so dynamically changing off late in fact the, just a report few days back has shown that the arctic temperature has increased by 5 uh, 5 degrees celsius mm-hmm. than the normal degree mm-hmm. and what it does is that uh, by increasing temperatures the arctic sea ice has mm-hmm. reduced over the last okay. 30 30 i mean 3 decades almost mm-hmm. 30% uh, 35% of arctic sea ice we have lost sea ice i mean arctic mm-hmm. sea ice okay and arctic sea ice and antarctica are very important for us because they act as a natural reflector meaning mm-hmm. the incoming sunlight is reflected out mm-hmm. so it keeps the keeps the earth you know very cool and if you mm-hmm. if you're going to lose it's more like a sunscreen that 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 we affect i mean it, it protects us from all the harmful uh, mm-hmm. uh, heat uh, kind of a thing and if arctic is now uh, uh, removed from the entire thing because the uh, sea ice melt then what happens is the ocean starts getting hotter and mm-hmm. with the ocean getting warmer you have more and more uh, you know uh, uh, it stops absorbing the greenhouse gases you have more greenhouse mm-hmm. there is arctic amplification mm-hmm. that happens and it's a mm-hmm. cycle that that continues mm-hmm. and uh, and slowly you you have the warming that happens and uh, mm-hmm. everything starts you know falling like pack of dominoes mm-hmm. and uh, people see climate change is something we people don't realize of late even it and it's very important that this notion is cleared that mm-hmm. if you if you have a hot day today and tomorrow say it rains people mm-hmm. attribute it to you know climate change that's mm-hmm. actually not the case that's basically a change of weather i mean mm-hmm. uh, there's a difference between the weather and a climate weather is something mm-hmm. that happens you know day to day or weekly or maximum mm-hmm. month uh, change mm-hmm. that's why you mm-hmm. have a weather forecast mm-hmm. you don't have a climate forecast Mm-hmm. climate is something that you see a change over the span of 30 years mm-hmm. that's only when you say that the climate has changed but what is happening is also pretty alarming mm-hmm. we have a lot of something called as extreme events people think mm-hmm. it was only global warming it's not only warming and that is the problem what what is happening because there are a lot of climate skeptics climate change skeptics they are saying mm-hmm. that you know there are places where you know temperatures are reducing and how are you saying that uh, there is warming which is happening so mm-hmm. uh, is a change happening not happening then the question comes in it's not mm-hmm. when we say the word climate change it is a change mm-hmm. from the regular what you were so it's so, not only so okay, global warming but it's also it's not only warming there are places okay. where there are places like in dubai we have had snowfalls hmm now dubai is known to be an arid uh, desert but now you yes. start seeing snowfall so yes. now people skeptics in dubai would say are ye to acha ho gaya in fact i mean now yes. we have cooler climate so mm-hmm. where is the question of global warming so it's mm-hmm. not about global warming that's why nobody uses nowadays the term global warming they say yeah. climate is changing Change. yes. and of late we are seeing lot of these extreme events yes. and uh, and all of these are connected antarctic controls our monsoon because why the southern ocean 
the amount of uh, moisture that the southern ocean will pass on to the indian ocean and then we have the monsoon that that, that mm. comes and monsoon is very important for us because yes. uh, our entire gdp is based on the agriculture industry yes, we are not yes. a manufacturing industry and if yes. for agriculture you need water and if yes. there is no water then 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 you know what can happen and similar is the case when we have monsoon happening here whenever all the heat which is trapped in the water is actually mm-hmm. passed on uh, it is said that it passes on to the arctic and then they have seen connection that wherever you have heavy monsoons in india mm-hmm. there has mm-hmm. been more of melting in the arctic mm-hmm. arctic glaciers so uh, let connected. me play, let me play uh, a, 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 some, a short clip from the film again and then we will uh, sure. uh, we will discuss sure a threat that has yet to be fully accounted for in climate models Permafrost is any land that remains zero, uh, zero degree Celsius or less continuously for two years or more. And uh, so this is a typical landform that is available in cold climate. Uh, it's mostly available in the northern hemisphere, but there are some permafrost starting to come out or being discovered uh, in the southern hemisphere as, as well, uh, some available in Antarctic. Here. In Neolazen, scientists are noticing patterns of rapid thawing of these permafrost regions. In order to reach the study area, precautions are taken by mandatorily carrying a rifle while leaving the settlement as a preventative measure against any encounter with polar bears. Scientists are discovering destabilized landscapes where permafrost that once thawed a few inches a year can now abruptly thaw up to several feet within days or weeks, and thereby accelerating emissions of up to 1,600 gigatons of carbon that is still locked underground. Yeah, so uh, what what is this like uh, now we are talking about permafrost so uh, it, this is uh, arctic and uh, do we have also permafrost in himalayas yeah, yeah of course of course of course of course any of the cryogenic region whichever you see mm-hmm. uh, especially the entire tibetan region uh, uh, right from you know whether it's uh, uh, ladakh or for that matter i mean of mm-hmm. course all the himalayan region also have, but tibetan plateau is mm-hmm. actually filled with uh, permafrost uh, so, but majority hap- majority is in the Arctic. So, what's happening with permafrost, and what what will happen if there will be so, no permafrost? So, what is permafrost? Permafrost is basically it is you know uh, soil and ice which mm-hmm. has been you know remained in the frozen state for you know thousands of years, mm-hmm. uh, kind of thing. And a lot of things have happened uh, whenever any plant or anything dies off, it remains mm-hmm. in that soil and it has been frozen and uh, left there. Whether it's just not the plant. It's also mm-hmm. the animals which have been lost, you know, like maybe from from last thousands of years, mm-hmm. they've been uh, kind of kind of decayed, but also mm-hmm. frozen um, in these permafrost regions. Mm-hmm. Now, because uh, the permafrost primarily contains ice, which is frozen. Mm-hmm. Now, with increasing temperatures, what is mm-hmm. happening is that this ice has started thawing, thawing as mm-hmm. in it started melting. So okay. you have now rivers of uh, water that is coming out from these uh, permafrost accretion. Mm-hmm. And that is kind of, first of all, destabilizing the landscape. So mm-hmm. a land which was, you know, perfect like this with a lot of snow and ice has now, because the ice is gone, so it starts caving in. So mm-hmm. all your uh, establishments, whether it's your uh, infrastructural development, I mean, houses or whatever, mm-hmm. have started mm-hmm. collapsing. Mm-hmm. And uh, permafrost over the thousands of years have actually, mm-hmm. you know, all these uh, uh, organisms which it has, mm-hmm. you know, frozen and protected and it has kept. Mm-hmm. Now because of the thaw, it has now started getting exposed. So mm-hmm. all that carbon, which was, you know, in, in a, we are carbon bodies, right? All, all the humans or animals or whatever, we are carb- our life on earth exists in the carbon form. Yes. So everything of that was trapped in these permafrost. And uh, carbon dioxide is one of the greenhouse gases. So moment Mm -hmm. you have these carbon coming out, the organisms um, which feed on them, all the microorganisms, microbial activity, Mm -hmm. they release in more amount of carbon dioxide. So you are actually contributing to the greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. And carbon is one of the most potent, uh, carbon dioxide is one of the most potent greenhouse gases, carbon and methane basically. 
so you have exceedingly amount of uh, methane that is uh, in fact uh, it is said that twice the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere mm -hmm. i mean the two times the amount of ca uh, carbon dioxide which is there in the atmosphere is actually trapped in this permafrost now if because of the melting and with uh, increasing temperature this permafrost starts thawing you are actually increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the earth's atmosphere and with green how grave is the situation rakesh it's extremely grave extremely extremely grave and um, uh, many places are actually seeing uh, a lot of uh, permafrost thawing that has happened especially in you know the siberian region or even in the uh, alaska region Mm -hmm. uh people are losing uh, uh, the land mm -hmm. people are losing their infrastructure uh, mm -hmm. and even their cultivation a lot of things a lot so it, it's a, it's a very important and, and moreover uh, of of late now what uh, scientists mm -hmm. have also discovered is that uh, say for instance a thousand year old uh, permafrost uh, which starts has started uh, decaying mm -hmm. and with that if the animal out there Uh, which was you know frozen for almost thousands of years has now come out into the open and moment it you know comes in contact with the oxygen of the atmosphere mm -hmm. and the microbial activity starts mm -hmm. along with the decaying along with the carbon dioxide and methane it can the mm -hmm. chances that there are these uh, ancient viruses and uh, bacteria which mm -hmm. were you know uh, like say the bubonic plague mm -hmm. for that matter or the smallpox or the anthrax for that matter uh which were you know trapped in these animals uh during those time and now slowly the pores are getting released out into the atmosphere mm -hmm. and we have already seen with covid what has happened mm -hmm. and slowly these these viruses they don't die they live in they prefer to live in these extreme condition they just need some breakthrough for them to release these kind of thing and this is a big worry that is that is going to uh, you know scare it us in the coming years from now mm -hmm. and uh, there are already cases like this in siberia there is a village apparently they found the entire village uh, uh, you know dead because there was a spore of uh, anthrax which got released and uh, things like that so, okay uh, so we talked about the problem so when we want to make uh, these kind of films it's environmental also and it's scientific also it's basically environmental science film so the one problem is like you know during uh, so we are talking for last like 45 minutes and there were so many jargons so for a filmmaker or for a new filmmaker how he will deal with first the interpretation of the data and about the jargon what he or she will do what 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 you can suggest to these filmmakers who wanted to make films what i feel is so whenever you do a film you always have a target audience in mind and when you do a film that is meant for scientific awareness i mean mm -hmm. whether it's uh, or science popularization and you're not mm -hmm. you're not actually doing a film for the scientist you're doing a, a film for the common public and this mm -hmm. common public can be anyone whether it's a student in a school or college uh, going student whether it's a uh, it's a sabzi wala whether it's even a security guard for that matter whoever it is i mean it's for them so when you talk to them uh, and i have always fought with people who make the statement that you need to dumb down the film it is it is not dumbing down the film i mean when you say the word dumbing down the film you're considering that the other person is dumb it is not mm -hmm. dumbing down the film you're actually trying to uh, get a film to a level uh, mm -hmm. in fact you're trying to make him understand the jargons in such a way that he can understand it i mean for instance uh, there might be uh, if i'm talking to a ca or a chartered accountant or a finance person there are so many things in finance that i don't understand because mm. there might be so certain terms or whatever it is that physical mm. Uh, mm. or whatever it might be mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't mean that i'm dumb it's just that i don't understand that term so mm. you need to get it to a level that they understand so don't dumb down your film okay get it to a level that they understand what what you're mm. saying that mm. is point 1 point 2 is that whenever you represent a data try to make it get that emotional connect to to the public what it means because sometimes you know we we talk about these big data is that people don't even understand like uh, if i have to give you an example uh, like for say for for the production of a chocolate 1 kilo of chocolate takes close to around some 2000 uh, a person sorry 17000 liters of water is needed to produce 1 kg of uh, chocolate Okay. now when i just randomly put this in the film people will not understand how much is 17000 liters but with that if i kind of connect 
that this 17,000 liters of water is equivalent to 2,000 people's drinking water requirement in a drought affected area. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, you show that human connect and you suddenly mm -hmm. start understanding the story much better. So now mm -hmm. next time you go and pick up a chocolate, you might even just think of those 2000 people who don't get drinking water and uh, kind of thing. So there's a emotion, emotional human angle that you end up, you need to put in your film. And that's very mm -hmm. important when it comes to, it's just not about making a science film, but also showing that what happens, what, what goes through, you have the human side of film. Sometimes what happen like films, like uh, films on climate change, like yours, sometimes, uh, uh, we try to find the data and and it it it's possible or it happened often that we come up with the wrong data or wrong fact so how yeah. a filmmaker who is not from science background uh, you know you can you know check those facts whether these facts are correct or these are a fact only fiction or these are false uh, uh, that's a very pertinent question i mean off late because today um, um, uh, you know we live in a media a social age media uh, that uh, spreading information is very easy. It's just a button. I mean, any yes. data that comes to you and you spread it and then it goes, I mean, whether it's through WhatsApp groups or whether it's in a Facebook post or Instagram post, but we don't have the habit of fact checking. Yes. And in the process, uh, there are a lot of things that, you know, whether it's agenda driven sometimes or whether it is uh, unbiased uh, publication, you just pick up something and then you just randomly do something and you put it because you're in the in the garb of the TRP and uh, mm -hmm. you know publishing it first and mm -hmm. we have noticed so many newspaper publications which are false mm -hmm. extremely false so yes. if you're making a science film it's important that you can use newspaper publication just as a starting point but you need you need not quote them I mean that would not be the gospel truth for you to pick up mm -hmm. your content or your film you need mm -hmm. to do good amount of research and now mm. research would involve you trying to read in some amount of research papers because mm -hmm. every topic that a newspaper would pick up for sure mm -hmm. there'll be people who would have done some good amount of research so mm -hmm. instead of just going to google and typing in go to google mm -hmm. scholar there is a term called google scholar i mean there's a, a, a platform called google scholar you can put yes. on that and you'll get a lot of research publications mm -hmm. and when you read through this research publication the research paper will mm -hmm. give you the author name and will give you the institution and will also give you his uh, methodology or something. Sometimes mm -hmm. it becomes very difficult for a non-scientific person to understand it. Yes. So the easiest way of doing this is to contacting the author. You, okay. His email address is, his or her email address is there. You can obviously write to them. Or also many of these institutions nowadays publish, uh, you know, they are uh, publications or research articles. There's research publications, there's research articles. Now articles are written more for policy makers so that they understand and things of that sort. But it, mm -hmm. it, it contains the scientific information. It doesn't mm -hmm. have these non-scientific facts that happen. So you need to pick up these particular things. And it's a research. It's not a science fiction that you write. So if you're doing a science film, it takes good amount of time in doing research and it's very important. And after doing all of that, when you write your script, it's also important that I suggest that people vet the script by sending it to a scientist or and preferably one or two scientists so that they Ex go through expert the of the material sometimes expert when we talk material. about the scientists uh, so yeah. it becomes oh my god uh, they won't have yeah. uh, you know time whether yeah. they will go through my uh, script or what they, so certainly if if uh, someone who is working uh, on climate change we can send this climate change someone who is yeah. working on the environment we can you know expert on environment absolutely. we can send it. that kind of absolutely because, uh, you know, news publications, they interpret things in a very different way at times. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Like if I, have to, if, I, if I have to give a small joke about it, which I just heard two days back and I found it extremely amusing uh, mm. kind of thing, like um, uh, a scientist doing an experiment or a news mm. publication doing an experiment sees a mm. frog. And, uh, and the idea of the research is to see if the frog listens to your voice command. Okay. So... He gets a frog and he says the frog to jump and the frog jumps. So now what he does is he cuts off one of the leg of the frog and he tells again, frog jump and the frog jumps. Now he cuts the second leg of the frog and then he tells the frog jump and the frog jumps. He cuts the third leg of the frog and he checks whether the frog will jump now or not. So he says frog jump and the frog also jumps. And now he cuts the, the fourth leg and the only leg that was remaining of the frog. And he says frog jump and the frog doesn't jump. So his interpretation, he writes, 
on cutting all the four legs of the frog the frog the frog becomes deaf <laughs> so, so that is that is the funny way of interpreting things you know i mean it's not that the it's just about finding connection and that is what the newspaper sometimes publications end up doing they'll find some random random stuff and they'll just try to connect it because they want to sensationalize it or get some things put up or uh, the, the question of trp also comes into picture and yes. uh, especially during covid times my god the amount of misinformation that was put in i mean i started seeing uh, newspaper articles um, kind of uh, you know uh, uh, telling the good side about uh, uh, banging spoon and uh, the plate i mean it was a gesture that a pm showed that we need to honor our first uh, first uh, defense workers Uh, yeah. and that was the only form of this thing but they started finding uh, you know the ultrasonic waves through the plate will you know <laughs> kill the viruses that's the thing i mean so if you look if you read newspaper publication and listen to it and then you publish it then you you are in a wrong uh, thing yeah so in cms vatavaran we do understand these kind of problems that's why rakesh uh, uh, you know uh, in 70 uh, from uh, 17 to 19 we had done Uh, a series of workshop in the all the himalayan uh, region all the 13 himalayan state on the climate change reporting where we try to you know train the vernacular uh, yeah sensitize these writers to how to interpret the data from where they should get and how to yeah. write a report for the climate change uh, yeah. yes so we were talking for such a long and there are so many questions which i can still ask but as we are coming to an end of the session so my last question abhi kya chal raha hai because Abhi you are still current. going to Him- Him- himalayas often yeah i'm actually doing a very interesting project uh, with the ladakh uh, administration um, mm-hmm. ladakh has the ladakh administration has uh, declared uh, henle uh, village in ladakh mm-hmm. as india's first uh, dark sky reserve okay so oh, what's that what's a dark sky reserve just like uh, you have a, a, a wildlife reserve which protects mm-hmm. the wildlife uh-huh. the dark sky reserve is a reserve which will protect the night sky so in the city we see so much amount of uh, there is a pollution that we say right we have the air pollution noise pollution but we also have something called a light pollution yes, and because yes, this light pollution we don't understand we don't see the the milky way and we don't see the stars and things like that all. so protecting an area and in that area there will be uh, uh, the there'll be regulations on the light and the villages even the the houses the curtains will be so uh, thick that there's no light that comes out of the houses mm-hmm. uh, there are a lot of regulations on the traffic that would go in kind of thing and uh, things mm-hmm. of that sort so that area will be totally protected from any uh, any form of artificial lighting and so why is that anybody so that anybody can come and uh, visit this place and enjoy the the night sky and of course we have the observatory also there and yeah. light actually affects the high altitude at uh, the himalayan mm-hmm. uh, observatory mm-hmm. the indian astronomical mm-hmm. observatory because mm-hmm. they have these sensitive instrument uh, and uh, you know they're getting these small faint lights coming from the star yes. so any unwanted lighting will affect the observation and it's very important i mean mm-hmm. that we are connected with the universe and the horizon i mean and okay. whatever so that's it's very important we preserve okay so it, uh, we're doing a pr- film for them for that wonderful project Uh, yeah and i also wish uh, in the near future i will also visit all those you know yeah. the uh, the lack of oxygen is a big problem for me there i was there uh, twice or thrice in lee and every time yeah, once you acclimatize i think you should be fine yes yes, yes. so thank you very much rakesh for uh, Uh, you know sure. you know talking to us in detail about all these three uh, poles and to uh, uh, help us to understand how these three poles are interconnected and how you know climate change in any way a change uh, will affect all the rest of the two so thank you very much and just to end i would just say that you know climate change is very real i mean uh, and uh, for sure if something is going to kill you in the years to come if not you your, your future generation is probably climate change so uh, it's very important that we all understand this issue and uh, mm-hmm. do small things but of course it's the small thing doesn't matter but i'm very happy the other day i i i i, I was very impressed with the girl from uh, rishikesh uh, mm-hmm. rizima pande when yes. i see the we the 10th standard uh, uh, girl 
talking so passionately about environment and the work uh, you know i remember when i was in the 10th it was all about studies and trying to score marks which which of course i didn't do but then <laughs> but then seeing today's kids uh, 10 standard girl talking so passionately about it and the kind of work they have done gives me hope and i hope this hope is propagated to more people and a uh, platform like yours should 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 be a, a light beacon for all these people thank you very much rakesh for the kind word and i wish you continue your your the remarkable work which you are doing and i will also request everyone to go to the india science ott channel and watch his wonderful film the climate challenge and rakesh i also wa- want to invite you to the uh, award ceremony online award ceremony which yeah. is happening on 23rd at 11 pm so do join us there sure, sure. thank sure. you rakesh thank you. thanks a lot thanks a lot for having me yeah have a great day bye okay. so friends uh this was rakesh now when we talk in detail about the climate change and the impact of climate change in all these three polar regions and about his film the climate challenge which is available to watch till 23rd of april at india science ott channel so please go and please watch uh, the wonderful 89 films which are especially curated and hand picked by the 2930 uh, prominent uh, uh, juries and uh, tomorrow also again for, at a 4 o'clock we'll be talking to one of the very wonderful filmmaker and he will be talk about his journey his films so please do join us tomorrow at the end i really want to express my gratitude to india science vigyan prasad department of science and technology government of india and also our rest of our program partners like the the the, the pollution control board of haryana government of haryana department of uh, forest uh, the canadian high commission in india chitkara university uh, iucn cc uh, i i also want to express uh, uh, you know my gratitude uh, to nabad uh, and 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 all and uh, government of india mofcc and all all the, uh, the partners uh, and uh, i really want to express my gratitude to my team members also uh, in cms watavaran so join us tomorrow at 4 o'clock to you know get uh, Uh, a, a wonderful talk with a very wonderful filmmaker again have a great day good night friends